At peak times, the team may be monitoring engines carrying 400,000 passengers. We're sort of watching in the region of 8 to 10,000 engines, 24 7, 365 days a year. Well, and that's the question is this pretty normal or is it not? We're looking at speeds, pressures, temperatures. We're just nipping problems in the bud before they happen. So you, people aren't waiting around in, in airports for the flight that's been cancelled or delayed again. So that's ultimately what we're trying to do. The centre receives a million and a half measurements every day from anything up to 1,200 Trent engines at a time. Typically a minute after the aircraft has sent that information, I can see it in, a, in graph form. The data is analysed by computer and if any unusual readings are detected, the engineers are automatically alerted. Probably 95% of them, uh, we can very quickly sort of work out that there's nothing to worry about. All the help desk engineers are experienced enough to solve any problem that might crop up. I worked with Rolls-Royce engines hands-on, uh, mainly in the Royal Navy, for 13 years. And they're just a phone call away from maintenance crews at key airports around the globe. Yeah, I've just had an email if he's asking for uh, data going back to January 2009, LP vibration data. Do you think you could answer that? Back on the assembly line, this Trent engine has hit a problem, just one week away from its completion. The final module needed for the vertical stack has been held up on its way from Europe. Without it, the stack can't move along the line. It's a turbine which, which actually drives the, the, uh, the big fan at the front of the engine, on, in the, uh, which was mounted inside the fan case. The engine is stuck in the assembly tower, but the fitters can't afford to lose any time. Instead, they've identified parts that can be fitted ahead of schedule. It could arrive any time in the next hour, it could be in the next day, you know, we don't really know. So what we've done, we've jumped ahead and um, carried on building to try and get things done. As it is at the moment, we can't move it, we can't pick it up without that final module. Any hold-up in the production process could cost money, so tracking down a replacement module is critical. And Cat Taylor is straight on the phone. Can you guarantee that it will reach us before 6 a.m. in the morning? Yes? Yes. At long last, it does arrive. And even though it's the middle of the night, the build will carry on. Working through the night is part of life for everyone on the production line. In Warwickshire, father and son Bob and Lee Blackwell are starting another night shift at the fan case factory. It's actually going to get to the body clock. It's quite hard. It's quite hard. By Thursday, you're sort of ready for the weekend and get catch up on your sleep. We tend to work the same shifts. On nights, we tend to get on each other's nerves. It's, uh, it's a testing shift, you know what I mean, when you're tired. <laughs> Tonight, they're working on a new fan case, bigger than any other, to be fitted to a new Airbus that is currently being built. This is the biggest component we've actually manufactured today, 118 inch diameter, so it's a challenge. I mean, this is something that we're really proud of as an organisation. It's a first in everything that we're doing at the moment. It won't be long before these parts are put together to make the first complete new fan case. When finished, it'll be the biggest Trent engine of all, with the lowest carbon emissions, and could become the third Trent engine in a row to launch a new jumbo jet. It has actually been the fastest selling Trent engine in history. We already have orders for a thousand Trent engines and uh, we will build that early next year, we will start testing it and we hope to see it in the skies about two years from now. But investment in new technology is worthless without investment in new people to keep manufacturing skills alive. I'm currently an apprentice at Derby at Rolls-Royce as a manufacturing engineer in engineering maintenance. Apprentice schemes like this are vital to British industry. 
This is Rotatives, this is my business that I'm working in. Um, they mainly, again, deal with the discs, drums and shafts. And in here we've got mainline shafts, so this is where they build the largest shafts which go through the main part of the engine. These are the coverings that go around them so they make sure that the parts don't become damaged. You've got the various drilling machines down here. And then as you walk through here, this is where I work, this is the shaft supports office. Like, from a young age, I was always into, like, building things and, like, designing. And then the opportunity came round of, like, me getting the young apprenticeship and also my family, like, my dad's an engineer, my granddad's an engineer, my uncle's an engineer, so I've had a little bit of influence as well from them. But generally, I just like engineering and I like the fact of, like, designing and building. I identified at an early age that, you know, he, he liked engineering because, you know, I think when he was about eight, I bought him a Connex and you know, in about the space of a couple of days, he'd uh, disregard, you know, he'd thrown away the manual and started making models of his own. Like every apprentice, Neeraj can expect to spend three years or more learning the basic skills of his trade. So having a passion for it is really important. Today I'm trying to make um, one of these control rods, which, as you can see, is here and basically it allows the pilot to control the amount of airflow that's going through the engine and change various settings in the engine of the flaps and the angles. He's told somebody you're 16, you work for Rolls Royce, it's quite a... They see you as in different light and suddenly, like, that you're actually something special and something a bit different because it's not... It's not... It's really quite prestigious to work in such a big company like this at the... At certainly the age that I am. So, first day's midge, blued out from one end to the other. OK. Second data image, 90 degrees to it. Check that with an engineer's square. Now I'm thinking, wow, what a change that a couple of years can make to a life. Because going from schoolboy to engineer, it's quite a radical change, and I'm quite pleased with that change. Once every engine is built and tested, its last stop is the customer delivery centre, where it has to pass scrutiny by engine inspector Mike Riley. It's a huge responsibility. His will be the last eyes to see inside the engine before it takes to the sky. I've been at Rolls-Royce for five years now. In fact, this month, before that, I was in the military as a helicopter technician on the first line maintenance. I've actually wanted to work for Rolls-Royce for some time before I came to work here, and it took me two years of applying before I could get in. So uh, it, it's not the easiest place to, to get into. Mike's is one of the most specialised jobs on the assembly line. Like a doctor doing keyhole surgery, he uses a boroscope to inspect the inside of the engine. Basically, every single rotating stage within the engine uh, we'll look at, plus the combustion chamber. Literally, the whole of the inside of the engine is boroscoped. This is the first stage HP compressor. Uh, at the moment, I'm turning it rearwards. Usually, the blades will come towards you. I'm just looking for any damage on the actual blade surface, leading or trailing edges. Occasionally, you can get a little bit confused in there because there are so many blades. This is the first nozzle assembly that we're looking at with all the hundreds of cooling holes on it possibly the hottest part of the engine here. You know, practically a surgeon. <laughs> After Mike's final inspection, another Trent 700 engine is bagged up and ready to leave the factory. In a few days, it'll be in France and fitted to another Airbus 330 plane, just one of 300 engines built this year. These engines are Rolls-Royce's key to success, but it's keeping ahead of the competition that will secure the future for everyone in Derby. But right now, there's a big day ahead.
Today, all eyes are on the performance of the Boeing Dreamliner, and of course, the Rolls-Royce engines that power it. It's a big day for the aeroplane out in Seattle, and an even bigger day for the team of engineers back in Derby, watching the preparations for the flight live online. As the aircraft prepares to take off and the engines fire up to full power, there's nothing anyone can do but wait, watch, and see what happens next. And here she comes, the 787 Dreamliner. Way to go, Rolls Royce! <laughs> It's a massive coup to provide the engines for a new airliner's first flight. And it's something to be very proud of for the people who build them. Quite an emotional moment for everybody involved, particularly for all the guys here who have built the engines, all the engineers who have designed it over the last four, five, six years. Uh, some of these people have devoted their entire lifetime at work to this. Ecstatic really, really delighted to see the aircraft take off after what's been a pretty long and uh, tiring journey to get this far really. But the success of the flight can only really be gauged when orders for the new engine start coming in. Great news, another order for five Trent 1000 powered Boeing 787 aircraft in place this morning. Particularly good because it's quite a tough market at the moment and so it does show testament to the technology in this engine that even in this market people are still placing orders. It's a great day to be in the job, it's a great day to be in Rolls Royce, it's a great day for Derby. For the 11,000 employees in Derby, it's another ordinary day, with more Trent engines to build. Come on, and in Warwickshire, it's the end of another shift for Bob and Lee Blackwell. But it's also the start of a new chapter in the story of the Trent engine, because the first fan case for the next engine in the Trent family is finally ready and about to be revealed. We've organised the corporate comms team to come down to take a team photo. So we're going to get everyone that's been involved in the project together. There you go, look at that beauty. There you go, that's it. Work of art. It's a work of art. It's something for Mark and his team to be really proud of. And a senior project manager from Derby He's on his way to see the unveiling. Ah, that's, uh, that looks really good. It's really good. Pull it this way a little bit further. And then have those two sitting behind it. We can all gather round the front, guys. If everyone comes in round the front, gather round. We've got to get some photogenic people. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major thank you to all of you and thank you very much for the fantastic effort you put in. This is so many firsts for us as a project. It's our first module and it's our biggest module and a major milestone for our first engine. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Well done.